In the early days of statistics, when the field of statistics was still forming, there was skepticism among some gentlemen scientists about whether statistics could ever become its own science. And the reason for their skepticism was replicability, or more accurately, the lack of replicability. In these early days of statistics, researchers would repeat experiments of other researchers, but often their results would not replicate. Repeat the same study, get different results. And this problem got worse with small samples. And what was that problem? Researchers at this time were relying on the normal distribution. Now the normal distribution works just fine as long as you have large enough sample sizes. So if you have 100 people or plants or Irish snakes in your sample, then the normal distribution is going to be perfectly adequate. And the researchers would do really what we did last time. They would collect a sample, use the sample mean as the point estimator for the population mean. And then they would calculate a standard deviation of the sample based on that point estimator, and finally use a z-score of 1.96 as a critical value or a cutoff score for determining margins of error, or later on in hypothesis testing. However, what they intended to calculate was not what they were actually calculating because of those point estimators. With a large enough sample size, the amount of error with those estimators is negligible, but with small samples, the error is huge. When you have a large sample size, then the sample standard deviation well estimates the population standard deviation. I modeled this example from a representative population with a true population mean of 16.94. For sample sizes of 30, the sample standard deviation was quite close with an error rate of 2.07 points. As sample sizes increased to 100 or up to 500, the standard error of the mean continued to drop, yielding very accurate confidence intervals. However, when your sample size drops below 30, the standard error can increase dramatically. For sample sizes of 15, the standard error of the mean more than doubled. Lose five more members of the sample, and the error goes up nearly a full point. Lose five more after that, and the error is more than triple what it was at 30. The sample standard deviation is a biased estimator of the population standard deviation. As sample size gets smaller, that bias gets worse. And correcting for bias is where this gentleman comes into our story. This is William Seeley Gossett, a brewer at Guinness Brewing Company in Dublin, Ireland. Guinness, at this time, had expanded its use of science in the brewing process and employed brewer scientists like Gossett to standardize the consistency of their product. So for example, Gossett might be studying the sugar content in the barley malt from various strains of barley. Now, barley malt is an early step in the process of making beer. Different strains of barley contain different amounts of sugar, which is measured in degrees saccharin. Sugar is what the beer yeasts eat, and then they excrete alcohol. So if you drink alcohol, you're drinking yeast whiz. Can you imagine what the yeasts must think about us? Drinking their whiz? It's a good thing the yeasts don't have social media accounts. If you have too much sugar in the barley malt, then the yeasts have more to eat and the alcohol content of the beer will be higher. Not a problem, you say. Well, it is a problem if you are being taxed based on the alcohol content of the product. More alcohol means higher taxes. On the other hand, if the sugar content is too low, then the alcohol content will be too low. And that could get you a scalp from a whole island of raging Irishmen who would get a binny on if you messed with their Guinness. Not a pretty sight. They'll get out that shillelagh and you're in for a whooping. So it's important to keep that sugar consistent. As you might imagine, mixing up batches of barley malt is a time-consuming process. You don't want to be mixing up 30 batches of barley malt for every strain of barley. And so Gossett was using much smaller sample sizes, mixing up maybe 
four batches of barley malt for every strain of barley, and using those numbers to make his estimations. And here is where he ran into the problem of the bias of the sample standard deviation being used as an estimator for the population standard deviation. With such small samples, the bias was predictably bad. The good news about systematic bias, of course, is that once you understand the magnitude of that bias, it's very easy to correct for. And that is what Gossett did. He began creating tables of how much he needed to adjust the critical value based on the sample size to correct the standard error. And this became known as the T distribution. Now I'm getting a little ahead of myself here because at the time it was not called a T distribution. That's what we call it now and that's why I'm using the term. Here is how this T distribution compares to the original normal curve or Z distribution. The T distribution is more leptocurtic than a normal curve, meaning that it has more thickness in the tails of the curve. The normal curve is the solid black line. Notice how the tails are pushed out for smaller sample sizes. With fewer degrees of freedom, the tails become more and more thick. Well, that doesn't look too bad, you say. But to really see this problem, we've got to look up close. With a normal curve, a z-score of 1.96 places 5% of the scores outside of the critical value or the cutoff score. In this case, we're looking only at one tail, which would be 2.5% of the scores, but I'm going to call it 5% while you remember that there is another tail on the other end of the curve. What we see here with the thicker tails is that instead of 5%, a distribution with 20 degrees of freedom has 6.5% of scores beyond 1.96. And with 10 degrees of freedom, nearly 8% of scores are beyond 1.96 the area that's supposed to be only 5%. So how do you fix that? Well, if you think about it, the solution becomes obvious. Gossett realized that the solution was to shift the critical value to maintain 5% of the scores in each tail. However, the amount of shift would depend upon the sample size. Therefore, he needed to calculate a new critical value for every single sample size each time asking, what would 5% be for this specific sample? And here's what Gossett did. For every sample size, he calculated a new value for 5%. For 20 degrees of freedom, the 1.96 would have to increase to 2.086 to keep 5% of the scores in the tail. For 10 degrees of freedom, the 1.96 would have to increase to 2.228 to keep 5% of the scores in the tail. The smaller the sample size, the greater the shift above 1.96. And after he did these calculations, Gossett wrote these answers in a table. And for completeness, he created various columns for different probabilities and different sample sizes. Therefore, what we have is not a single distribution, but rather a family of distributions, one for each sample size and probability value. Here is an example of the table that Gossett created. Now, this same table is included at the last page of your course notes, and you can find similar tables on the internet. Notice how we have columns for both one and two tailed tests, at both 0.05 and 0.01 alpha levels. Having put in so much work, understandably Gossett wanted to publish his tables. And here is where he ran into another problem. Guinness did not want him to publish. And before I explain why, let me dispel a few urban legends around this story. One mistaken explanation is that Guinness did not want to acknowledge that there was variability in their batches of beer. They wanted to pretend that every Guinness was exactly like every other Guinness. Now, this explanation is highly unlikely, especially considering that Guinness was employing these scientist brewers to improve the consistency of the batches of beer. So variability in beer was no secret. Another urban legend speculates that Guinness worried that its competitors would use Gossett's work to improve their own products. 
This is also highly unlikely, because as Gossett himself argued, these tables were useful for statisticians, but contained no information that could be of use for brewing beer. In another tale, Gossett knew that Guinness would not allow him to publish if he asked, and so he published secretly. And Guinness never found out his identity until after his death. But here are the facts, as related by Box, his historical research, and his review of the Guinness board meeting minutes. Guinness did have concerns about publication because some previous scientist brewers had inadvertently published trade secrets in another publication. Therefore, they had a blanket prohibition against publication among their scientists. However, as Gossett successfully argued, these tables were only of use to statisticians, not for brewing beer. And the Guinness board agreed. However, they allowed him to publish with one stipulation. In order to avoid problems with other scientists or other employees, they asked that Gossett publish anonymously. And so it was that Gossett published his tables in 1908 in the journal Biometrica, edited by Carl Pearson of Pearson's Correlation fame. In order to publish anonymously, Gossett may have considered using the pseudonym Teacher, but because that name had already been used by another researcher, Gossett chose the pseudonym Student, and Pearson called the tables Students' Z-Tables. Well, why do we call them Students' T-Tables? In 1912, four years after Students' Tables were first published, Carl Pearson received a letter to the editor from a young Ronald Fisher, pointing out a mistake in students' Z tables. Now you might think it's rather cheeky of a young man in his 20s to write such a letter to the editor of the most prestigious statistical journal of the time, but that was Ronald Fisher, creator of the F-test, or the ANOVA. He and Pearson butted heads throughout their entire lives and careers. However, their conflict redounds to our benefit in the overall improvement to statistical science. Fisher noted that in students' Z tables, the total sample size, n, should be reduced by 1. The table should use degrees of freedom, n minus 1, not sample size. And Pearson realized that young Master Fisher was right again, and Pearson republished students' tables, this time calling them students' t-tables, and that is the name by which we know them today. In this course, we will use students' t-tables for comparing sample means. You will use a t-distribution whenever the population standard deviation has been estimated from the sample standard deviation. But what about the z-test and the normal distribution? Do we still need those? Because the t-distribution approximates the normal distribution as sample sizes increase, you are safe to use the t-distribution for both large and small sample sizes. In short, it is safe to use the t-distribution all of the time. No need to do z-tests. We will still use the normal distribution when we're comparing proportions. However, when we're comparing means, we're going to stick with the trusty T distribution. We're going to learn how to create confidence intervals around both means and proportions in our next few videos.